this. Um, not really. Uh, I, I care very much about them, but um, the people who study Mark Twain are a very, very friendly lot. Not to say people who study Willa Cather and Langston Hughes are not, um, but it was a very welcoming community, and places like this um, just don't exist in the scholarly community for other kinds of um, literary figures. So um, it was it was a wonderful boon um, studying Mark Twain. Um, and so I started out thinking about um, how authors came to their writing through the places that they came from and from their homes. And I was very interested in houses. Um, and it ended up, as I studied the houses, I was even more concerned about how the museums in the houses came about. Um, because you'll notice that even though it seems like there are a lot of Mark Twain museums, there are even more houses than there are museums because we've lost a number of them. Um, Stormfield no longer exists. The house in Buffalo no longer exists. Um, and I'm, oh, the house that they lived in very briefly in Isle, Iowa no longer exists. Um, so there are a number of houses, and it's possible the birthplace no longer exists, um, despite uh, the museum that says otherwise. So um, there, there, there are a lot of historic house museums um, devoted to Twain. And there, there's one that I don't talk about in my book that my mom visited, and I have a great picture of her, not included in the slideshow, of her standing in front of it. And I believe Mark Twain is the only literary figure that has, or, or, or figure of any kind, I should say, historic figure of any kind, that has a site devoted to the place, well, it's called the Mark Twain Family Cabin. And I don't know if any of you have been there, but it's in part of the Museum of Appalachia. And it's purportedly the place where he was conceived. <laughs> so as far as I know, no other figure of any kind has this kind of museum to, to put his name on it. Or her name on it. Um, so he does have a special status, way beyond Hemingway. Hemingway has a lot of historic house museums as well. Um, but I don't think we know uh, of a museum devoted to his conception. <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> oh, please wait. That's better than no signal. There we go. the mother that they should buy this house where these terrible deeds have happened. He says, houses don't have memories. And somehow this convinces her that it's okay. And of course we know it doesn't turn out too well for them. Um, but I would have to say I disagree. And I, I assume many of you also disagree that houses don't have memories. Um, we uh, infuse our houses... You can't see the uh, words from the back here. So okay. <laughs> sure. Um, the quote says, houses don't have memories. Oh, and can you hear me? Okay. Not, too good. Not too good? Okay, I'll try to stand in front of the microphone a little bit but more. Um, so the quote is, houses don't have memories, and that comes from the movie Amityville Horror about a house where it has a very, very bad memory. Um, but I would, I would imagine that a number of you don't agree with that statement. I don't. Um, we infuse our houses with memories, whether they are museums, historic sites, or houses like the farm house here at Quarry Farm. Um, or our own houses. They stand as their own form of public history, visibly, though most often silently, telling us who we are and what our communities and neighborhoods are and what they have been. Um, tonight, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about Clemens' experience as a literary tourist and historic preservationist, and then I'm going to talk about three of the sites I cover in, um, in my book, The Boyhood Home in Hannibal, Missouri, um, the birthplace that I mentioned earlier, and the Hartford House. And then I'm going to have a couple closing uh, ideas, and then we'll have a Q&A. Um, and, and to sort of start off where um, I left off with my biography is when I started looking at authors' houses um, and trying to think about the connection between um, authors and the, the places where they live, I ended up being really, really interested in how those places get turned into museums and why it is that people go there, and why it is that people go there who never read books by the people who live, who live in the houses, and how those houses sometimes inspire them to read books. Um, so 
I was really fascinated by this phenomenon of literary tourism. And that sounds kind of fancy, but it really just means people who go to places that have to do with books. Um, and Nicola Watson, who is a British literary historian who studied this phenomenon in the UK, says that it is the practice of visiting places associated with particular books in order to savor the text and the place and their interrelations. And I have to say that I have rarely seen people savoring texts. I see them going there, I see them poking things, I see them grabbing items off historic bureaus and handling them when the tour guides aren't there. But it does seem like people do a lot of things, a lot of social things in literary houses. They take their family members there when they're in town for a visit. Um, and sometimes that's when they first discover Mark Twain's house or whoever's house. Um, but I think Watson is close. We go to these sites to learn something contextual about the people who lived in them. And I see literary tourism as merely the practice of visiting places associated with li literary figures or celebrities, um, literary ce celebrities, um, whether these places are associated with the life of the author um, or his or her fictional creation. So you'll know that there are a lot of literary sites associated with the bridges of Madison County. Um, so sites that, um, that don't have any connection to the author's life still can become tourist sites. Um, so, first, Mark Twain and literary tourism. I might need someone to forward my slide. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Um, Mark Twain and Olivia, or sorry, Sam Clemens and Olivia Clemens visited Stratford in 1873. And they were literary tourists. To be arguably the first literary tourism site ever, um, at least in the English tradition. So Shakespeare's birthplace became a literary site in 1769, and the Shakespearean actor David Garrick thought, we need to celebrate Shakespeare, and we should do it in his hometown. Um, before that, when people wanted to get close to their literary favorites, they went to their graves, and they pondered their genius at their graves, and they even did grave rubbings. Um, but in David Garrick had this genius idea, and since then, we have gone to people's houses to reflect upon their lives. Um, so, uh, Sam and Olivia went to Stratford. While they were on this trip, they also went here, Abbotsford. Now, Twain famously disliked Sir Walter Scott and did not like his writing at all, but he spent some quality time at his home. And at both of these places, they brought back mementos. From the Shakespeare house, they brought back a sapling from the Shakespeare mulberry, and from Abbotsford, they brought back the two um, full editions of the Abbotsford um, Scots works. And one, I believe, they gave to um, uh, uh, Susan and Theodore Crane, and I think the other they kept for themselves. Um, but so they were literary tourists in the full definition. And they knew that great authors, especially those associated with the nation and um, considered a favorite of the nation, had authors' houses turn into museums. And this was not long before they, uh, they built their house in Hartford. <coughs> so they did some literary tourism. They may have done more. But beyond that, um, Sam Clemens was involved in the preservation of two places. This is the... Um, I believe, the birthplace of Eugene Field, who was a Missouri poet. And at the time, in 1902, when Twain dedicated his birthplace, among many literary figures, he was considered a much more important and solid uh, American author. Um, and Twain was considered a lesser author, so it was a great honor for Twain to be allowed to dedicate this birthplace. Um, meanwhile, we don't really remember Eugene Field. You may be wondering who he is. He, um, among many things, wrote some children's poems, including Little Boy Blue, um, I believe. Um, but so Twain went in 1902 on his last trip to Missouri and dedicated <coughs> Eugene Field's birthplace. He said some nice words, and a week later, Eugene Field's brother revealed the fact that he had dedicated the wrong place. <laughs> it was actually a house that he'd lived in later on in his life. He lived in several homes when he was a young child, just like Mark Twain, and they were confused. And so Twain said, never mind, it's of no real consequence whether it is his birthplace or not. A rose in any other garden will bloom as sweet. Um, so he's a little you know, skeptical about whether that mattered all that much. Um, a birthplace that he believed mattered a great deal was Lincoln's birthplace. 
and he went so far as in 1907 in the New York in a New York Times editorial to endorse it in this way. He said, "Some people make pilgrimages to the town whose streets were once trodden by Shakespeare, but in most cases, the connection between the great man or the great event and the relic we revere is accidental. Shakespeare might have lived in any town as well as Stratford." Interesting. Um, but it was no accident that planted Lincoln on a Kentucky farm, halfway between the lake and the gulf. The association there had substance to it. Lincoln belonged just where he was put. If the Union was to be saved, it had to be a man of such an origin that would save it. So he really understood that preservationist ethic that was, that was taking place right at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. That was, it was important to save the places associated with great people. Um, especially people like Lincoln, especially people like Washington, and the founders. Um, but at the same time, in the face of growing national interest in the commemoration of historically significant great men, and the belief that American history was the result of these great men's actions, Clemens understood that such places become monuments akin to religious shrines for people, and that some of those shrines are relics that, um, that might not need to be relics. So he had this... He, even though he went to Stratford, he didn't consider that especially important. But Lincoln's house, he considered very, very important. Um, so moving on from Clemens' own thoughts about preservation, we're going to talk about some of the houses that are preserved in his name. So the first on our roster is the boyhood home. So this is that same picture of Sam Clemens in front of his boyhood home in 1902 on his last trip to Missouri. The Boyhood Home becomes a museum in 1912, so just 10 years after this photo is taken, and just two years after Clemens dies, which is a pretty radical turnaround in the house museum world. Um, and it's actually one of the first literary museums in the U.S. It, the, 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 um, the movement is really just getting started in 1912. Um, and it came to be a museum because a local businessman in Hannibal purchased the house when it was set to be destroyed and gave it to the city. And it's still owned by the city. It's run by a nonprofit, but the city still owns it. Um, and Hannibal and the man who gave the house to Hannibal, George Mahan, wanted to preserve the house for a number of reasons. Not the least of which was um, a similar reason to why a number of house museums were being built across the country, and that is in the wake of the Civil War, people were really embracing places, especially in the South, where all of the nation could come together and celebrate a historical figure. You have Mount Vernon getting enormous support. You have Monticello getting enormous support. And you get Mark Twain's Boyhood at Home getting enormous support across the country. Um, but beyond that, in Hannibal, um, George Mahan was a very uh, <coughs> prominent local businessman. He was a state representative. He was an attorney for the Atlas Cement Company that was just outside of Hannibal. And he was very interested in promoting Hannibal. He was interested in promoting Hannibal to outside Eastern interests, and he wanted it to look like a place that had history, and look like a place that had history that mattered. Um, and he also was a big Mark Twain fan, so I don't want to leave that out. He was hugely excited about Mark Twain. Um, so excited, in fact, that occasionally he really promoted Mark Twain, and specifically Tom Sawyer, over the history of the town itself. Um, and beyond that, there had been a long-standing interest in where Tom Sawyer lived. And a lot of people believed that he must have lived in Hannibal. Um, and so this is an illustration from the very first edition of um, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And you'll notice the house looks... Let's see if I can do this. Well, it looks a lot like the last house. It's a little more rural, um, but it's a very similar house. And at this point, the, the illustrator, I don't believe, had seen Mark Twain's Boyhood Home. But from here on out, illustrators use the Mark Twain Boyhood Home as the model for Tom's home in all editions. So people who read The Adventures of Tom Sawyer immediately recognized Sam Clement's house from the books that they'd read. Um, so this is an example of Norman Rockwell's um, illustration that is exactly the window in the back of the house that Tom slash Sam might have climbed out of. Um, but other illustrators did this too. Many editions had the same phenomenon. Um, and they did this in part because people had really been looking for Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, and Becky Thatcher, including Clifton Johnson. So in 1906, there was already a book 
that ha um, it was the highways and byways of the Mississippi Valley, and it had a whole chapter on Mark Twain country. And they had already sort of outlined all the steps to follow Mark Twain through Missouri, um, and had come looking for these characters. And they actually weren't interested so much in Mark Twain or Sam Clemens, but they were very interested in the Huck Finn house, and the Becky Thatcher house, and the Tom Sawyer house, which conveniently are all there. Um, and they're there because George Mahan was also the same man who dedicated the house to the, to the city. He was also the president of the Missouri Historical Commission and um, uh, on their board for many, many years. And in 1934, he wrote history all over the town, um, including all of a sudden Tom Sawyer's fence. So it wasn't a fence. This wasn't Sam Clemens' fence. This was Tom Sawyer's fence. And these plaques are identical to all other historic plaques in the state. So it really, truly does look as though these characters lived all over town and did this stuff. <laughs> and they're all still there. <laughs> Except for one, which you can read about in the book. Um, here's the Becky Thatcher house. Um, but it's, I mean, it really does write the history of St. Petersburg over the history of Hannibal. And I'm going to skip a lot in the history of these sites, um, but basically this creates a problem for Hannibal. Um, it creates a problem because they don't have a history museum. And suddenly things that are named after sites in Mark Twain's books take on that name. So there was a, a hill in Hannibal called Holiday Hill. Well, now it's called... Does anyone know the name of the hill? Cardinville. Yeah. So they now they have erased their own town names, and they have the names from Tom Sawyer. And it's, it, it has caused a problem. And it also caused a problem because they really whitewashed the story of Tom Sawyer, too. So actually, Jim doesn't exist in this town anymore. I mean, it does now, but it created a problem where scholars like Sh uh, Shelley Fisher Fishkin and Terrell Dempsey, who have been speakers here, had to point out the fact they had erased their own history, that we no longer had a history of the slave town that was Hannibal. We had a history of St. Petersburg. Um, and so they really had to, in the 1990s and 2000s, go back and remind people that Sam Clemens did live here and that his family did hold slaves and that in that house they held in particular a child slave named Sandy. So now the site actually does a relatively good job talking about this, the history of slavery in Hannibal, um, which is, is a hard thing for most historic sites to do. And it's, I wouldn't say it's a model, but it's getting there for other historic sites. Um, the next... Uh, oh, oh, so this was just to prove that the, um, the signs are still there. Um, this is from 2007. Um, the next site we're going to talk about is Mark Twain's birthplace. Um, so Mark Twain was born in Florida, Missouri in 1835. And this is a picture of Florida, Missouri in 1944, the same photo shoot as the little kids in Hannibal. Um, and the, 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 the uh, pedestal and the bust... Um, the bus is no longer there, but the pedestal is still there. But they're supposed to be in the place where Mark Twain, the, pl the cabin where Mark Twain was born, existed. And there has been interest in the place where Mark Twain was born since at least the 1890s, when apparently somebody tried to purchase his birthplace and bring it to the 1893 Chicago World's Fair so that it could sit along with the White <laughs> City, where they did just by chance have Abraham Lincoln's birthplace and um, Jefferson Davis's birthplace there on exhibit. So this was to be right next to it. Unfortunately, they had a little trouble moving the house and it ended up staying here, or we think it did. But um, by eight, the 1890s, people were already very interested in his birthplace and getting a piece of it. By 1906, before 1906, when Clifton Johnson did that tour book for um, Mark Twain Country in Missouri, um, people had been coming through here, and, and there was already a bit of controversy over where exactly Mark Twain had been born. And people had consulted the experts. They consulted Mark Twain's mom and his brother, and they weren't entirely sure. Um, because honestly, the cabin looked a lot like other cabins. It was a very um, hard scrabble place that had been scrapped together from other places, and that was likely scrapped together into a new, a new and different place. Um, but when Clifton Johnson got there, he met a woman who showed him two houses. One was a log cabin that everything had been stripped out of. All that was left was the logs. And you know why they were stripped? Because people wanted pieces of Twain's birthplace. But then she showed him this other cabin and, um, and told him that this is really the birthplace. And she knew this because her mother had been in the town when Mark Twain was born, and she was pretty sure that her mother had told her that this was where he was born. Um, and so Clifton Johnson took this as fact. And then later, 
Um, Albert Bigelow Payne, when he came to find, who's Mark Twain's friend and biographer, came to find his birthplace, she told him the same story. And he, he knew that there were also competing sites, um, but he took this as Mark Twain's birthplace too, and it has been circulated as such since then. Um, and when, when, Payne was, when Payne had seen the site, he wrote afterwards, um, it is still, the cabin, is still standing and occupied when these lines are written, and it should be preserved as a shrine for the American people. For it was here that the foremost American-born author, the man most characteristically American in every thought and word and action of his life, drew his first breath, caught blinkingly the light of the world that in the years to come would rise up and in its wide realm of letters hail him as king. So he wrote these inspiring things about this birthplace, which may or may not be his birthplace, but it inspired the woman who pointed it out, her name was Miss Eliza Violet Damrell. It inspired her son to buy the house, move it to his yard, and fix it up to restore it. And he actually built, I believe, the platform in front so you could more easily have your photograph taken with it. And he occasionally let newlyweds sleep in it overnight. Um, so he opened it to the public in 1915, and he really wanted to cash in on the 1912 excitement around the boyhood home. They're about 30 miles apart. Um, he never quite got the enthusiasm that the boyhood home did, perhaps because of this authenticity issue. Um, but by 1925, he'd been convinced to give the birthplace to the state of Missouri so it could be part of the very first Missouri <coughs> State Park. Um, and it didn't quite work out that way because as soon as the state got involved, people started saying, well, I don't think it's the one, I don't think it's the one. And the state got a little nervous. They had already accepted the cabin. Um, but by 1930, they did create a state park for the cabin and they built a cabin around the cabin to protect it, and you could see it through a screen or go there on Sundays and get inside. Um, and, and that's pretty much what it was like until the 1960s when the state of Missouri built this building around the cabin, um, which really evokes, strangely, I guess it's pretty horrible, but Claire Clippins did sign off on it and um, on an earlier design. and. Um, so the cabin is in, is in this side, and in that side are all of the relics and Mark Twain items that were collected by Missouri friends and family who wanted a place to exhibit it. So they really rallied in the 60s and got the state to build the site. And this is what it looks like inside. Um, so you can see the cabin and you can walk around. Unfortunately, in the 1980s, uh, one of the site administrators there, not unfortunately, fortunately, unfortunately, um, the site administrator there decided, who's an architectural historian, decided to test the house to see if it was really as old and built the way, if it was authentic. And his findings did not um, save the house from question, I guess is how I would put it. Um, he found that a lot of the windows and doors had been moved from where they would have been. Um, maybe to make it look more like a cabin that he might have lived in. Some the boards were of various ages and quality, and the nails were not from the time of Clemens. But the house was used afterwards. And so there is still the possibility it could be at least in part, as some element of it, um, part of the Mark Twain birthplace. Um, but we don't know. The, the, the third site I'm going to talk about tonight, and I'll talk about this rather quickly, is probably one that you might be more likely to have gone to. First, I'll take a quick survey. Who has been to the Hannibal House? Okay. Who has been to the birthplace? Awesome. Um, who has been to Hartford? Okay. I figured there'd be more hands there, and there are slightly more hands. Well, the Hartford House is a much more traditional trajectory as a historic house. It was saved in the 1930s by um, Catherine Seymour Day. But before she saved it, it had another. It had several other lives. It was a private residence with the Bizzle family. Um, Richard Bizzle was a research, uh, sorry, an insurance uh, executive in Hartford, and he, he and his family lived there until 1917. And then in 1918 or 17, they started uh, renting it out to the Kingswood School for Boys. And so there were a lot of changes that had happened to the house. And then I don't have a photo of this, but after it was the boys' school, it became uh, uh, it was broken down into apartments, and it was apartments for women. So in 1930s, 1929 really, um, Catherine Seymour, oh, sorry, that's a sneak attack. Um, Catherine Seymour Day, who is the grand niece of Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, starts a campaign to save the house because it's going to be torn down and turned into high-rise apartments. Um, and she has a really hard time saving the house. 
And you wouldn't think that would be the case because Hartford now so embraces it, but at the time, people hated Victorian houses. They hated Victorian architecture. Nobody was interested in it. And they thought that Sam Clemens' house was a particularly offensive version of Victorian architecture. <laughs> Beyond that, they weren't actually huge fans of Mark Twain. Um, a lot of them objected to his politics. A lot of them always saw him as a Missourian who didn't really fit in, and he left there. So there weren't a lot of people around. There, basically, there were still enough people around who didn't like him that it was difficult. And then there were those people interested in architecture who thought the house should be torn down immediately. Um, so she had a tough time, and there had actually been a campaign to try to save it before by the editor of the Hartford Current, and it just, he had a terrible time. I mean, he wrote about it as the event that changed his life from being a good editor to being someone hated in the community, in his, in his memoirs. But so, Catherine Seymour Day wants to save the house, but why does she want to save the house, you might wonder. Well, she doesn't want to save the house for Mark Twain. She wants to save the house for uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who is her um, uh, great aunt. And they happen to share the yard. If you've been there, you see that they're very close. And she knew if the apartment complex went in next door, her likelihood of saving this and having its historical integrity would be very much lessened. Um, and she wanted to save her family's papers, the Beecher papers, the Day papers. Um, and her family had a long standing connection to the state of Connecticut and its founding. Mm -hmm. And she knew that those were important American papers to save. And Mark Twain was somebody people knew, and that was okay. Um, and so she wanted the house to be turned into. Oh, sorry, this is a picture of her. Also, Hal Holbrook, as a young man, doing his research and trying out his, his work in the 50s at the house. But this is, um, this is Catherine Seymour Day right here. She looks a little skeptical, I think, there. Um, <laughs> but she turned the house into a branch of the public library. Um, the upstairs was still private apartments for women, and the downstairs was turned into a branch of the Hartford Public Library for many years. And she ran this house from, the from 1929 until 1961. Um, and she was not a young woman in 1929. Um, but in the 1950s, she had the good sense to bring in a really young board that had a lot of diverse abilities. And they wanted to make the house a historic house museum. And one of the people that she brought in was this um, literary scholar from Yale. His name was Norman Holmes Pearson. And he made sure that everyone on the board was in the know and that they did not call Mark Twain a children's author. They did not call him a humorist. They called him an American literary figure. And beyond that, he made it clear that if they were going to do this restoration, they were going to do it perfectly. They were going to find every object that had ever belonged to Twain, every piece of wallpaper, every piece of flooring, every window design, and they were going to restore the house to its perfect incarnation of Twain. Um, and they did. They started in 1955. They had done little, uh, little experiments into it before then and it wasn't finished until 1974, which was the centennial of the house. Um, and at the time, it was an absolute model for historic restoration in this country. And they did it room by room, which was, they did it that way because they didn't have any money. But what it did was it brought excitement into the house, and people would go back to see when the next room was open, and people would do things like pay to have the bookshelves restored in one room, um, and then they would move on to the next. And so they really felt, the community felt the pride of ownership, especially the board. Um, they kind of had their own problems. By restoring the house to the perfect order of the Clemens period, um, and they had to choose a specific era of the Clemens period there, they didn't leave that much room in the house for Tom Sawyer. It ended up being all about Sam Clemens and Olivia Clemens and their children and the true history of these people, but not Sam Clemens' alter ego, Mark Twain and his literary figures. So there was no Tom Sawyer running around. Um, so. They tried to do a little museum work in the carriage house, and then they ended up realizing they were going to have to build another space. Um, that's when they built the, the visitor center and the museum, which in some ways led to some of their financial problems in, the, in, the, in recent memory. Um, so each of these houses had its own sort of stumbling blocks with interpretation, whether they chose to interpret only Tom Sawyer or only Sam Clemens. So I'm going to skip over Elmira. I write about it in my book, but I don't want to talk about it here because you guys know more about this house than I do. And its, it's history is so young, and this site's history is so young, that it's just being written. But as you no doubt know, with the fact that so many books have come out of Quarry Farm and the Quarry Farm Fellowships, that this is perhaps the most important place for the generation of scholarship 
by far and beyond a number of these. But I will say that this house and their study into it was that first foray for that, um, for that kind of scholarship. And one of the board members wrote one of the first books on Mark Twain and his family, and I found it upstairs in the library and brought it because I thought it was so interesting and because it le leads so much to um, scholars like Michael Kiskis's work today. But um, her inve uh, Edith Colgate Salisbury's investigation into Mark Twain's family led her to his relationship with, um, with Susie, and she wrote a whole book about the letters that she uncovered in her research on the house. Um, but so one of my main points is that by preserving people's houses, we preserve their stories beyond the house themselves, and we get to know about all kinds of things about their lives. Um, and that, oh, I got myself all confused when I picked up that book. And that is one of the um, the main things that historic house museums can do for literary figures. Um, one thing that's easy to understand from these stories also is how hard it is for historic house museums to change. Um, the Boyhood Home had to really struggle to start telling the story of slavery and Sam Clemens' family. And likewise, the Hartford House had to really struggle to change the way it had been telling the Sam Clemens' story as well. Um, but both did. But it took them, you know, it took, this, took the Boyhood Home maybe 90 years to get there. Um, the Hartford House turned around a lot more quickly. Um, but one of the things I think is important about historic houses is that studies by researchers like Roy Roizenzweig and David Thalen um, have shown that nearly half of all Americans visit a house museum or a historic site um, every 12 months. And it ends up that that's a higher percentage than of Americans that read literary books. Um, so it's interesting, but I'll, and I mentioned before that a lot of people go to Mark Twain's, house who, to Mark Twain's houses who haven't read Mark Twain, um, but they learn about him there. And what they learn about them there, him there is what they know about him quite often. Um, so these places are incredibly important in our understanding about who Sam Clemens was, who Mark Twain is, and where Tom Sawyer lives. Um, so the stories that they tell are important. Um, and, uh, okay. Sorry. To sum things up, Mark Twain's houses do important work. They tell us about the very different versions of Mark Twain and Tom Sawyer. Um, Mark Twain in Hannibal is quite stunningly different from Mark Twain in Hartford um, and at the birthplace. But these houses do much more than spread the gospel of Mark Twain and Sam Clemens. They tell us a great deal about the people who worked and worked to preserve them. The George Mayhans, the Dad Violets, and the Catherine Seymour Days. And they tell us about the communities that they're in and what those communities value and how those values have changed over time. It ends up that the legacy of Mark Twain's historic sites and their public history work is that they allow us as visitors to stop and reflect on our own context, ours and Mark Twain's. They allow us a place where we can briefly go through the steps to imagine the past and our own relationship with it. Even people who don't love and read Mark Twain want to see where he lived and how he lived because we need places to hang our history on and we need houses to hold and evoke these memories for us. Houses, and specifically domestic places, are like no other historic object. They allow you to stand at a window, or in a doorway, or in our case, stand or sit out on the porch, and imagine things in the past. And this is the way houses do have memories. Thank you. I read it, I had to read that letter before. I'm, again, I fall for that thing. 
but um, I find his letters in particular just much more fascinating than his literary works because they reveal the whole human and the whole humor um, and the way that those things are worked out with individuals that he cared about. Um, he wrote something about the Hartford House that said, this, is, this house has a soul and eyes to see with and deep gratitude and whatever or not. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful quote. It is a wonderful quote. Uh, can you tell me more about its source? Yes. What, thank you. So he wrote that in a letter, and I want to say to his attorney, but I'm not positive. It might have been to Twitchell. Is it Twitchell? Is that yeah. um, um, but he wrote it on the occasion of Susie's death. So he was writing about the house as a place where it was okay that his daughter died. Because, it, oh, wow. because the house loved him so much and loved their family so much. Um, and so it's really bizarre that a lot of other house museums have used that quote to describe themselves. Because it is such an evocative, they just use that part about the house yeah. and you don't see the rest of the context. And, um, but it really was, it was about the Hartford house as this place that kept their soul. So where can we find the whole letter then? You can find the whole letter at the Mark Twain Papers, um, okay. and you can just search for house with the key keyword house or keyword home, and you should be able to find five or six letters, and it's among those. Okay, thank you. Yes. Mark Twain lived in a lot of different places, as we know. Have you looked at the sequel to this one? To look <laughs> at his other places, like in Italy and. I would back. love to look at some of those places. I have not looked at all of them. I have not been to all of them. And he had a lot of other sort of vacation properties that, um, or not that he owned, but he also owned a house up, um, not up, I guess from here it would be over, uh, that he never lived in as well. So I, I definitely think I could keep on going with this project right. and going with it. I think that these are the most significant houses in their own histories because I've mainly studied them since he lived in them. And not so much <laughs> while he lived in them, but if I were to go back to my original project, there'd be a lot of places I think that would be uh, meaningful to study. Um, and so I, I fight myself all the time to keep keep myself from doing that. Because <laughs> I could, I could just, you know, live my whole life chasing his homes for sure. Yeah. In your book, do you address, um, you know, you, you mentioned the characters like when we saw Becky standing by, you know, Becky. Mm -hmm. does, does your work yet, or maybe you have plans to, address mm -hmm. the fact that, like, I, I couldn't help but hear you said Sam Tom. And there's a, there's a scholarly vein, more than a vein, I'm not mm -hmm. current, that says, in fact, Tom was not Sam. In yes. fact, Tom was a scathing indictment of everything that was yeah. wrong with St. Petersburg. Yep. So when you said that, I went, ooh, wait. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I'm curious, as you got deeper, did you encounter in any of the interviews you did with other scholars that back over nostalgizing these homes and creating a sentiment that was there, but could impede the education that Twain, um, in and of himself, was not loved for at yeah. that time? Yeah, I would say that by and large, the folks in Hannibal who sort of put up forward the Tom Sawyer interpretation at the house right. did not get that. Um, and, and if they did, they purposefully ignored any parts of their <laughs> conscious and unconscious that would let that, or consciousness that would let that come forward. Um, because they were really invested in this, the all-American hometown that, although was also an indictment, was, was something they embraced. Um, so they didn't embrace the negativity at all. Um, and in fact, but they, it was a choice. It had to be either or. It couldn't be both. It, it, I mean, it because, could be both. And well, I think that they would argue. Their perspective was. Yeah, yeah. It's their home, so it kind of can't be both. Right. Well, and that's it. And so yeah. in terms of the educational aspect of that, which, which what his work as a social, yes. his social commentary, that is what's, that's working against the yeah. literature. The, some of that marketing is working against the very literature that he was trying to. Oh, absolutely. You know, it was 100% working against, especially yeah. um, the Adventures of Fenn. Um, so, yeah, they, in fact, um, Shelley Fisher Fishkin wrote a great book called Lighting Out for the Territory, where she traced her time through Hannibal, and she interviewed people in Hannibal, and they said, yeah, we only do the Tom Sawyer stuff. <laughs> um, we don't do that up and stuff. Um, so, you know, a lot of it was, you know, the Tourism Bureau said this is a story that sells, and a lot of it was something that people actually embraced. And so that's what you found. It's so still absolutely... Even though there were some inroads... There actually
actually been a lot of inroads, and I should I can speak a little bit about that now. After um, the 1990s, they brought in a panel of scholars who were serious plain scholars, including Susan Harris, um, and they said things have got to change. Um, and they brought it to the board, and they kind of came up with a compromise because by that time they had been interpreting Tom Sawyer's history here for so long that actually Tom Sawyer is now history. You know, it had become a manner of being in the town. Um, and they wanted, basically what they decided to do was do a compromise where it was both fiction and Clemens. And so now, I have some other photos, but I don't have them with me. They interpret both in the house. So there are these giant white plaster Mark Twains in each room. So he's there, but then there's a Tom Sawyer crawling out the window. Um, and so it kind of speaks to... I mean, they've imagined it as Mark Twain came back in 1902, and now he's leading you through the house on a tour. And he's telling you, there's where my fiction happens, there's where my house, my, my life happens. Um, and so there are little um, plaques that are him recollecting his time there and his own life, and then there's the fiction going on simultaneously. So it's actually a pretty interesting sort of postmodern interpretation, but since we know people interpret house museums very literally, I think it can also be somewhat confusing. They found that, um, for instance, at the, the uh, Poe House in Philadelphia, they didn't have any idea what kind of furniture Poe had there. So they just did some, they painted some furniture white so that they could indicate what use the room was. And they were like, how interesting that Poe had white furniture. I didn't know that was kind of, so people really, and it's not that they're not thinking, it's that people literally believe things that are in a museum are well researched and the truth. And so when you have white, they trust. Mark Twain's statues, they think, not that there was a giant white Mark Twain there, but that, that, that there was something, that there's something else going on there. So you have, it's a slippery interpretive method um, that I think most people find really fascinating, but some people might find kind of confusing. And some people might find hides some of the things that you're talking about. Yes? Well, we know that the, the Lincoln cabin is fake. Oh, oh yes, I totally uh, mentioned right. that. Uh, yes. Although it's probably representative. That, uh, yeah, it's that, called symbolic by the National Park Service. No, that, that turns, it turns out maybe the Twain one is the same way. I, I wish that they would say it was a symbolic birthplace cabin because it ends up that all of our most important great white men actually didn't have birthplaces and we've had to create them. So George Washington's birthplace, totally fake. Um, Abraham Lincoln's birthplace, maybe there's a log in there, but they're pretty sure everything else is fake and that it actually might be part of Jefferson Davis's birthplace. Which is so antithetical to so if Mark Twain could claim that saying, like, I am so important they invented my birthplace, um, I think it would actually be a really nice interpretive boon for the birthplace. <laughs> yes. The Stormfield still exists? It doesn't. It was burned to the ground, more or less, and it's been rebuilt kind of at a sort of three-quarter scale. So it's something you can drive by and see, but it's not at all the place that he lived in. But um, it exists in photographs, and there is relatively well documented. Yeah. <clears throat> Many places uh, change the size of the population uh, that were houses. How, how large was Hannibal in this? Uh, in its heyday? Well, the Mark Twain's. Uh, you know, I probably can't actually give you an accurate figure. I'd have to check my book. I think I did mention it in there, but I don't remember. Okay. Um, I do know that Elmira, uh, not Elmira, sorry, <laughs> um, Florida was about. Um, 60 families when, I think, 60 families, 100 people when um, Clemens was born, and now, as of the 2000 census, it has officially no population. Wow. And it, actually, the site and the state park has a fascinating history that involves women being involved in preservation, and an all-black uh, CCC camp that built the park, and um, it has a number of really great stories they could tell at the site beyond um, the stories that they do tell, and, and, and in addition to better stories about Mark Twain. Yeah. Do you know about the house in Buffalo? I do know that it, it, it burned. Um, uh, and I can't remember when it did burn, but I, I looked into it, and there is one article written about the history of the house, um, and I can find that citation for you if you're interested. Part of the house actually is still there. Oh, it is? Yeah, I've okay. been there. Okay. And it, it hasn't been totally destroyed. Okay. Do you know what kind of restaurant? <laughs> uh, it was just American fare kind okay. of thing. Okay. Yeah, but it was, uh, oh, okay, well, it was very nice. I had dinner there. Oh, nice. Yeah. Did they 
have any Mark Twain theme interpretation going on? Yeah, a little bit, but that okay. was back in the 70s when I went, so okay. I'm not sure it's changed. <laughs> okay. It's okay. still there. All right. It's just not completely there. So. Okay. Okay. And I have not been to the Mark Twain family cabin, but um, I do hope to go. Yes? The Hartford House you described as Victorian. Yes. The thing that Twain wrote was against... I know. I mean... I know. Is um, it, is it, was it truly Victorian, or was it, for better word, a kind of bastardization of a... Absolutely. Architecturally, um, I would say architectural historians don't consider it a Victorian, but they consider it gilded. Yeah. Um, and they consider it... Uh, well, I have a word for it in my, in my book, but it's not a term that I ordinarily use. Um, but, but so, even though it's not a traditional Victorian, it was seen as part of that movement and like a particularly bad part of it. Um, so even though we can see a little bit of arts and crafts was that, in it. Was and that like, purposeful? Purposefully, did he want to build something that people thought were, was ugly? Um, I don't think so. He loved, no, I think he, he truly loved the look of the house and he thought, he thought it was like a particularly American art form of a house and he was really proud of it. Um, and other people called it very terrible things. Um, somebody said it looked like a teepee, it looked like an adobe hut, which we all know it doesn't look anything like adobe, but I think they were just trying to say it looked like this kind of, because maybe the pattern brickwork or something, looks like a native motif. Um, and that was considered bad. Um, but there were a lot of reviews that were circulated widely in not just Hartford papers, but elsewhere, about how you should come and see this sort of jaw-dropping eyesore. <laughs> but we don't think that today. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. <laughs> and I'm happy to answer any other questions. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation.